Isn't that a great picture? Like, I wish, like, you know, for those of us who, uh, maybe you didn't think it was a great picture, I did. Um, but, like, I love to think of my mom being that age and making that face because as your parents get older, you see them so seriously. But there is a childlike wonder in each of our lives when it comes to Christmas, right? You hear the music, you get all nostalgic, and, um, and there's this, this character of Santa Claus, which we're going to unpack today. And, um, and talk about, but there's also some realities that um, in this next series that'll take us through the season of Christmas, the church calls it Advent, I call it Christmas because that's what most of the world calls it, but the season that we're about to go through, we're going to talk about redeeming Christmas because it's become a cultural movement far more than it has a Christian movement. Our songs get terrible, and last Christmas I gave you my heart, and the very next day you gave it away. That Oh, that's terrible Christmas theology. And Glass Tiger is a horrible band, but um, that's a different story. Redeeming Christmas focuses on some of the key elements of Christmas, both the season and the celebration, and we redeem it. We remind ourselves of some of the amazing roots that Christmas has in some of our traditions. And we're going to look at it and invite you to participate in a unique way. So, I want you to take a minute. You're going to think with me here, okay? Do you remember, like, what was the greatest gift? Don't shout it out, but what was the greatest gift when you were little and toys still were king of the hill? What was the greatest toy you ever got on Christmas? Like, think about it. Anybody have it? Yeah, you do. Mike's like, yeah, I do last year. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you think about it, like, all I have to do is, like, what was your favorite Christmas present? I can still remember opening the paper and seeing the G.I. Joe, yes, I'm that old, G.I. Joe F-14 Tomcat Sky Striker with the little action figure ace, because he was an ace pilot. I remember pulling it out and being like, and now I am Top Gun. Like, I was, it was awesome. And I flew it around the backyard with the articulating wings and everything. I could hear the doon of Top Gun playing as I played, mostly alone, but in my backyard, <laughs> right? I landed it. The aircraft carrier was our trampoline. It was awesome. I remember opening the paper and being like, truly, Christmas is to be celebrated this year. <laughs> this is magnificent. This is all Christmas was ever meant to be. As a child, I loved that gift. I loved it. I know you have something like that too. Probably too proud to admit that you maybe wept at a bicycle or, you know, were super emotional over an easy bake oven where you ended up eating batter. But, but it was awesome, right? We have these moments where we remember the gift of Christmas that we got and it really means a lot to us. Today we want to talk about Santa the perceived giver of gifts in our culture. And we want to unpack some things and say, wait a minute, are we missing the point? Are we missing the point with some of what's going on? And then really when I say missing the point, are we diluting something that is really valuable and worth knowing? Santa, I just want to tell you something. Prepare yourselves, Christians everywhere. Santa is real. Now, when I say Santa, you're like, you mean the fat dude with red cheeks who flies with reindeer? Probably not that guy, but there was one. And we're going to talk about some of what would have formed him and how it should form us. We're going to do that by starting in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy is a letter written to Timothy. Timothy is the protege of the Apostle Paul. He is serving as a pastor in Ephesus, and Paul writes these words to him. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their, hel- their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up, for themsel- they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life That is truly life. The next scripture I want to talk about is out of Corinthians, and I want to kind of look at together, and we're going to deal more with this, and then we'll close kind of with the Timothy passage. This servant, well, Corinthians, let me just say this, Corinth was a city. It's in Asia Minor, kind of Turkey, uh, Greece, and um, it it is a port city. It was wildly 
Well, it was a port city, right? All you have to say is it's a port city where sailors stop by and visit. It was a little bit crazy, but it was also very wealthy, very influential, and people were excessively abundant in that culture. And Paul went to Corinth with the gospel. He shared the gospel. Many people came to Christ. And because of their coming to Christ, they began to care about the world around them. Part of their new world was the church in Jerusalem, which by the time Paul wrote this was coming under heavy persecution and would eventually be laid waste by the Roman Empire, the entire city of Rome. But they were in desperate situations because if you were a Christian in in, uh, Jerusalem, you couldn't get a job, you were exiled from community, you were kept out of temple, it would have been devastating, okay? Okay. So Paul encourages the church in Corinth, which is a port city doing pretty well for itself, to be generous and care for the needs of a fellow group of brothers and sisters in Christ. They give, and this is Paul's reply, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs to the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, listen to this, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of Christ. Let's read that again. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I want you to think with me, what gift is he talking about? His indescribable gift. Imagine a church where people are starving literally to death. People are suffering all over. And imagine with me this gift arriving to the people in Jerusalem and them being like, oh, and losing words. That's not the gifts Paul talks about here. The indescribable gift is not a gift of money. It is not a gift that meets an earthly need. The indescribable gift is the gift of Jesus Christ that would prompt someone to live such a generous life. So for you and I, what we have to do is ask ourselves the question, what do we do with God's indescribable gift? What do we do with the indescribable gift of God that somehow promotes in us a generosity and a faithfulness to God that causes us to get our eyes off ourselves and onto him? And I think the the reality is, maybe Santa's a good pivot point for this. Let me ask a question. Who here believed in Santa when they were little? Yeah, you did, right? Do I have any believers in the room? Yeah, you're like, Jesus or Santa? Santa, I'm talking about Santa still. Yeah. All right, so good, because we're going to dispel a couple of myths, but we're going to give you something much better. In 280 AD, there was this young man. He was a boy. When his parents died, they were very wealthy people. His name would become St. Nicholas. He lived in Turkey, Asia Minor. He was an orphan with a vast amount of money. And so what he did is instead of looking at how much he had lost and kind of doing the Batman thing, I have no parents, so I'm going to make cool toys. Like, that's not what he did, right? What did he do? What did he do? He became the most generous of his community. And he went out... Even in the poverty of his own life, emotionally losing his mom and dad, went out and took care of people's needs in his community, quietly and in secret. He would care for people time and again. He was a real person who lived not because he just wanted to be generous, but there was something else that compelled young St. Nicholas to be faithful. He knew Jesus Christ. He knew Jesus Christ. St. Nicholas was not just generous with money. Do you know one of the things about him that makes me most happy that he's Santa? He was a theologian. He would go and he would refute heresy. When people would speak or teach the wrong gospel, Santa would stand up and say, ho, ho, no. He would go off, right? I didn't do that in first service. I just thought of that joke. All right, that was awesome. All right, um, Sorry, that made me happy. But he would be like, no, and he would put his, kind of put his foot down. He'd be like, no, and he would speak the truth of Christ without fear and with deep conviction, and he would call the people to believe correctly about God, and a correct belief about God in the life of St. Nicholas transformed him into a fearlessly generous man. He's known for his giving, but he should also be known for his adequate and very stout theology. He knew Jesus Christ. 
the Spirit of God accompanied him in his life. And he would go about giving witness to God, and it was believed because of his witness of generosity. He would be faithfully generous. So let's take a minute and understand that Santa, St. Nicholas, we'll call him for the rest of the service, is very much real. And his witness is one of Christian service, not one of greed and compulsory behavior to get something. His life was one of Christian witness. So what we have to do here is look at the man, the myth, and the legend. The myth for you and I, it's pretty clear, right? So I would say Santa in our current context contributes more to a desire to have more material possessions, reward-based behavior than pretty much anything else. Like, how creepy is Santa? He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. You have a restraining order against him because that's not cool, right? That's not all right. He's this omnipresent. I was watching Home Alone 2, which is a phenomenal movie, and I was watching it with my kids this weekend, and um, this one little boy says, you can't say that. Santa is omnipresent. And I was like, oh, like it stuck in me like bad theology sticks. Santa is not omnipresent. The Lord our God is, but not Santa. Santa doesn't hear all, see all, be all. We have this weird myth about him, some dangerously confusing parallels with God that he's all-knowing. He's a wish granter. Hang your stockings, say your prayers. Invite him in, cookies, milk, and maybe you'll get something good. There's this legend of what we've been taught that completely dilutes what actually was and what was the true St. Nicholas is far greater. It's far more impacting to the real world, the legend the legend of Santa, you know, of this, of this person who, um, who, who was so generous and so giving, and, and people wanted to tell the stories. You can look in Psalm 112. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. No wonder the world remembered the man who refuted heresy, who argued doctrine, and who gave generously. That is a triune part or picture of a really good person, a person who loves Jesus, knows him, and is faithfully generous and witness to him in the life he lives. Of course he would be remembered. Of course he would be a legend. But I believe that Satan has turned the witness of St. Nicholas, a good and faithful Christian, into the very epitaph of greed over America. $670 billion will be spent on Christmas this year. When you think about what it means to consume, you have to look and say, do we believe in the right thing? Do we believe in the kind of life that St. Nicholas lived, not because he was a good person, but because he was redeemed, and he believed in his redemption and the power of God in his life and through his life? A reminder for us today should come of gospel-inspired generosity that takes away the concept, maybe the myth of Santa and puts into our lives a living embodiment of who we're called to be. Shamelessly generous. So, let's talk about the true gift of Christmas. The gift that came, not wrapped well, but the gift in a manger. The thing that actually transformed St. Nicholas's life and made him a legend worth remembering. There's been many generous people throughout the years. Why St. Nicholas? Because his life accompanied the gospel. His life accompanied the gospel. Go back with me to that gift you first got when you were little. The gift that made you be like, oh, I know you have it too. I know you've had that awesome gift that you got. Well, I won't say which one of our kids, but one of the kids in our family is a shaker. You ever have one of those? They open the gift and they're like, oh, and they start shaking and you're like, do we need to see a doctor? Like it's very upsetting because they, they shake, they make noises, and, and they can't control it. It just, and they just, oh, they, they get almost bound up. The reaction to an amazing gift, this may hurt a little, but why does the church have such a flat pulse when it comes to the gift in a manger, to the Son of God being sent into a world where Herod wanted to kill him, the Romans would crucify him, to a teenage mom yet unwed to a carpenter. What an incredible gift of trust 
the very almighty God in a manger. The second Corinthians passage just stands out to me in this when it says, the service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. I think that should be said when we consider this of our lives. When we consider the love of God that compelled his son to a manger, that something like this is that our lives would be overwhelming in many expressions of thanks to God for what he did in the gift in a manger. The gift in the manger can be summed up in one word that's hard to define, grace. The gift in a manger can be summed up by grace. The best way to understand grace is to understand what it isn't, right? Justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Driving down the road, 67 and a 35, Johnny Law with his radar. Oh, Christmas tree lights up behind you. Oh, license and registration. Here's a $280 ticket, three points off your license, and you have a good day. You too, officer. I deserve this. None of us say that, but we do. Because he wasn't doing 67 until he caught us. And it's not our, his fault that his radar gun works, right? Justice is getting what you deserve. Thank you. I enjoy these three points on my license. You know, how am I going to explain to my wife I just spent $300 by going fast? Like that kind of stuff, right? Justice. Justice is miserable. Nobody wants justice, getting what you deserve. But then there's mercy. Mercy would be um, a benevolent person trotting out of the bushes and laying out three $100 bills and saying, I'll cover your ticket fee. It's okay. I get it. You're in a hurry. Honest mistake. And walks off. And you're like, you, my friend, are awesome. That'd be mercy. Just a gift for no reason. But it helps kind of pay the bill. But what do you do about the three points that stay affixed to your license and to your insurance bill now? What do you do about that? So you you have mercy, which is just an act of kindness. You have justice, which is an act of correct. Then you have grace. Grace. What is grace? Grace is the thing that comes in and wipes the slate clean and recognizes, A, you did something wrong. B, you deserve punishment. C, an act of mercy in Jesus Christ has saved you. And D, grace redeems your present, your past, and calls you into a future in Christ. Grace releases you to live unbound by your mistakes and free in the life Christ won for you. When we look at grace, what we have to understand is we receive the full benefits of things being not only made right and settled, right? But the difference between grace and judgment and mercy is actually that when the slate is wiped clean, the judge calls you up to the bench and then tells you how to go and live faithfully in participation with him. I mean, how crazy would that be? The judge is like, come here, try this robe on. Here's a gavel. All right, we're going to administrate this life better together. We're going to go out and care for people's needs. We're going to show grace. You'd be like, no way, I'm a judge. No. What you are is you're called to a new place, a higher calling, something above your current state. You're called into the identity, into the person, into the crucified and resurrected life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace is what gives you Son and daughtership to God. Grace is the greatest content that we get as Christians from God. The gift of God in Christ Jesus is that we are given grace to freely live for him and no longer be bound to this life. So the question is, to this gift in the manger, this grace that comes in the person of Jesus Christ, what do we do? What is our response 2 Corinthians 9.13 says, because of your service that you have, by which you have proved yourselves, others will see your obedience that is linked to your confession of Christ. Get that. Because of the service, because of the active living faith you have, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your proclamation, I'm a Christian, and there is an obedience that proves it. 
That's why Santa is so real. Want to hear a cool story of real St. Nicholas? There was a dad in this ancient world, 280 BC, or AD, 280. There's not much going on. The Roman Empire is kind of starting to collapse. Things are getting a little dicey. And he is this wealthy person who could live comfortably to himself, be a hermit, well-fed, well-lived, and die in perfect peace. But what does he see? He sees a dad who has three daughters, and the dad is impoverished. And he knows that if he does not pay for a dowry, the dad doesn't pay for the dowry for his daughters, that they will be sold into the oldest trade in the world for women at a certain age. Now, a dowry is the amount the father pays for the daughter to be married off, which I am dislexic. If someone wants Bella, $1 billion. <laughs> Just to let you know. Um, <laughs> there's no way. Um, but, but the father would give the money for that. He had no money. He was broke. And the night before his oldest daughter is going to have to be taken the next day to the brothel, they wake up in the morning and there's a small purse of gold, enough for the dowry for the daughter. And the next daughter, the same thing happens. So the third daughter, the father waits up in a dark corner. And when St. Nicholas comes and puts his money on the table, he stops him. And the only reason he did it was because he wanted something more for the girls that weren't his. He wanted to take care of them in the way that Christ had cared for him. To give them something they didn't deserve, maybe didn't even ask for, but would be eternally grateful for. That's the kind of Santa we're talking about. That's the kind of thing that says that your obedience coupled with your confession of Christ shines a light that generations will not soon forget. The church needs to understand that our witness to Christ is not just, I believe in Jesus Christ. Jeremy's witness, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, now is required to be backed up with a faithful life as a husband, as a dad, and as a member of this church. He has confessed Jesus Christ, but now he must go and live it. And the challenge to him and to you rests the same. What do you do with the gift in the manger? Do you keep it only for yourself, or do you take it to the world? So, this Christmas, I would like to apply this in this way. First of all, let's stop cheating our children and grandchildren of the true story. Santa Claus is very much real. He may eat reindeer, but he doesn't fly with them. He doesn't have a jolly red nose and these things. He's not the Coca-Cola Santa. He's a living person whose life, by the grace of God, compelled by the Holy Spirit, gave witness to the life of Jesus in him. What if we started telling our children and grandchildren the real story of Santa and that Santa's message was, you better know Jesus Christ so you can live for Jesus Christ. After all, Christmas was about Jesus, wasn't it? Christmas was the time when the church on its high holy days would remember that Jesus Christ came as a baby, not as a conquering king. And he called us to serve as he did, to be made nothing. Even if the world would judge and scorn us, we would serve as he did. The calling to us is clear. Don't let the kids just hear the stories of Santa that equal greed and confusion and a mixed theology of an omnipotent person. Let them hear the stories of what their life is supposed to be like in Christ, of how an inspired, gospel-filled Christian life should act in this season. The second thing is this, practice joyful generosity with everything, with everything. Be wildly generous. Don't close your fist off and you're like, great, Eric wants money. Nope, it's not what we're talking about. There are people out there dying for a conversation, for someone to listen to them. There are people in desperate need of someone to just come and be a part of their life relationally and they're in this room. And we sit here and go, no, I don't think he's talking about me. I am, very much so. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about you. We must be practicing joyful generosity with our whole being. Yes, it includes finances, your treasures, but your talents and your time. 
It doesn't just happen by osmosis. We have to take part in the Christian life and practice joyful generosity in everything because our joyful generosity becomes part of how we live the gospel out. Francis of Assisi, the Catholic saint, said, preach the gospel at all times. When necessary, use words. We must have an obedience that accompanies our confession, and it's found in generosity. Not this miserly mind, mind, mind that holds for itself, but an open-handed reality that everything is God's anyways. He's just letting us play, the, play with him in his kingdom. We found where he's at work and we're joining him in it. The best example I have of this is in this video clip. Check it out. The reality we face in this, and it, and it really comes out of that first line, is when Scrooge McDuck, you know, it's the best Christmas, um, not Christmas story, Christmas Carol version ever, by the way. But um, when when Scrooge wakes up and he goes, "Oh, the spirits! Oh, I didn't, I didn't die. I, I still have it." <gasps> they gave me a second chance. In a way, this is a calling to a second chance, to to be generous. To, to practice joyful generosity with all that you are. Not just fine, you can have it, but rejoice in the fact that you're called to live a joyful life of generosity. Enjoy living like Christ did, a life of fearless generosity. Fearless generosity. Jesus Christ is our example. You have to make the most of it by a joyful participation in generous living. Body, soul, mind, spirit, the whole of you is a generous gift to this world. How will you spend it? Third and final thing is keep perspective. This Christmas, keep perspective. Give the lasting gift of life of faith. May your family, your children, your coworkers, your school, your friends in school, may they all recognize that you have perspective on this. Yes, yes there are some things you want for Christmas, and I get it. It's a hoot. But it's not everything. Keep some perspective. Let your life become a living declaration of the gospel. Share with people the gift of Jesus Christ and do so without apology or hesitation. I would invite us as a church to have perspective on what matters because of the true gift in the manger, the one that Santa kneels before, the Lord Jesus Christ Almighty. Every tongue will confess, every knee will bow that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we recognize as a church we have been called to participate in the life of Christ at Christmas, when everybody is singing most of our songs, see there's some bad Christmas carols, but there are some Christmas carols playing on secular radio that have some of the greatest theology ever in them. So my invitation to you is to not let Christmas get stolen by even misunderstanding what a great saint, St. Nicholas was. He was a fearless defender of the faith, and he was fearlessly generous with all that he had, and his legend lives on to this day. My challenge to you would be this. What will they say of us 500 years from now? Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we, we recognize even in our culture that the, the calling of generosity is almost toxic in our mind. We don't know what to do with it because we, we are people who often, God, we want more, sometimes just for the sake of having more. So God, forgive us for that idolatry and turn us now towards the one thing, the one thing that satisfies, the all-sufficient name of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we know that in this life there are many tempting things that draw us away from you. But there is one thing that captivates the heart of the Christian, and that is the name spoken, heard, sung, and prayed to of Jesus. So Lord, as we pause now and quietly go into a song where we prize and hold close the gift of the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, may our hearts be softened and then challenged to live a life similar to that of St. Nicholas, one of fearless generosity. Not because we figured it all out, but because the name of Jesus was given 
and has transformed everything. May your transforming power come even as we sing of that great name. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I promised we would end with that, uh, that passage out of Timothy. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God. One of the arrogances of the Western church, the United States church, let's just be honest, of our church, is that we can walk away and say, I don't think he was talking to me. I am talking to you. I am talking to me. Our selfless life speaks of Christ. Our self-centered life preaches us. We are people who are not called to the arrogance of self-confidence, but to the glorious generosity of Christ's dependence. We are dependent on him day in and day out to be exactly what he promised, our Lord and our Savior. So for you and I, the question goes out, what will they say in 500 years? I don't know. But the definition, the answer to that question starts when you leave this building. How now do you live a life of fearless generosity that resembles that so much more of the true St. Nicholas, one who knows what they believe in Jesus and will defend it, but also one who is fearlessly generous even to those who don't deserve it. My friends, may that be spoken of us, even as it was of him. May our lives reflect not only the ethic of St. Nicholas, but the one who called him the Lord Jesus Christ, who, being in very nature God, did not see equality with God as something to be grasped, but he made himself into a servant. May we become such people. As you go, may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's time to answer the question. You are dismissed. The church must leave the building.